Part One of The Man in the Moon by Francis Godwin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Man in the Moon by Francis Godwin. Part One. To the ingenious reader, thou hast here an essay of fancy where invention is showed with judgment. It was not the author's intention to presume to discourse thee into a belief of each particular circumstance. Tis fit thou allow him a liberty of conceit, where thou takest to thyself a liberty of judgment. In substance thou hast here a new discovery of a new world, which perchance may find little better entertainment, in thy opinion, than that of Columbus at first, in the esteem of all men. Yet his then but poor espial of America betrayed unto knowledge so much as hath since increased into a vast plantation, and the then unknown to be now of as large extent as all other the known world. That there should be antipodes was once thought as great a paradox as now that the moon should be habitable. But the knowledge of this may seem more properly reserved for this our discovering age, in which our galilapses can by advantage of their spectacles gaze the sun into spots, and to descry mountains in the moon. But this, and more, in the ensuing discourse, I leave to thy candid censure, and the faithful relation of the little eyewitness our great discoverer. E. M. The Man in the Moon It is well enough, and sufficiently known to all the countries of Andalusia, that I, Domingo Gonzales, was born of noble parentage, and that in the renowned city of Seville, to wit in the year 1552, my father's name being Ferrando Gonzalez, that was near kinsman by the mother's side, unto Don Pedro Sanchez, that worthy count of Almenara, and as for my mother, she was the daughter of the reverend and famous lawyer Otho Perez de Salaveda, governor of Barcelona, and corregidor of Biscaya, being the youngest of seventeen children they had. I was put to school, and intended by them unto the church, but our Lord, purposing to use my service in matters of far other nature and quality, inspired me with spending some time in the wars. It was at the time that Don Perando, the noble and thrice-renowned Duke d'Alva, was sent into the Low Countries, Bidelicet, the year of grace, 1568. I then, following the current of my foresaid desire, leaving the University of Salamanca, whither my parents had sent me, without giving knowledge unto any of my dearest friends, got me through France unto Antwerp, where, in the month of June 1569, I arrived in something poor estate. For having sold my books and bedding, with such other stuff as I had, which happily yielded me some thirty ducats, and borrowed of my father's friends some twenty more, I bought me a little nag with which I travelled more thriftily, than young gentlemen are wont ordinarily to do, until at last, arriving within a league of Antwerp, certain of the cursed uses set upon me and bereaved me of horse, money, and all, whereupon I was fain, through want and necessity, to enter into the service of Marshal Cosi, a French nobleman, whom I served truly in honourable place, although mine enemies gave it out to my disgrace that I was his horse-keeper's boy. But for that matter, I shall refer myself under the report of the Count Mansfield, Monsieur Tevier, and other men of known worth and estimation, who have often testified unto many of good credit yet living, the very truth in that behalf, which indeed is this, that Monsieur Cossy, who about that time had been sent ambassador under the Duke d'Alva, governor of the Low Countries, he, I say, understanding the nobility of my birth and my late misfortune, thinking it would be no small honour to him to have a Spaniard of that quality about him, furnished me with horse, armour, and whatsoever I wanted, using my service in nothing so much, after once I had learned the French tongue, as writing his letters, because my hand, indeed, was very fair. In the time of war, if upon necessity I now and then dressed mine own horse, it ought not to be cast in my teeth, seeing I hold it a part of a gentleman, for setting forward the service of his prince to submit himself unto the vilest office. The first expedition I was in was against the Prince of Orange, at which time the marshal my friend aforesaid, 
met him making a road into France, and, putting him to flight, chased him even unto the walls of Cambrai. It was my good hap at that time to defeat a horseman of the enemy by killing his horse with my pistol, which, falling upon his leg, so as he could not stir, he yielded himself to my mercy. But, knowing mine own weakness of body, and seeing him a lusty tall fellow, thought it my surest way to dispatch him, which, having done, I rifled him of a chain, money, and other things to the value of two hundred ducats. No sooner was that money in my purse, but I began to resume the remembrance of my nobility, and giving unto Monsieur Cossy the Esalos Manos, I got myself immediately unto the Duke's court, where were divers of my kindred, that, now they saw my purse full of good crowns, were ready enough to take knowledge of me. By their means I was received into pay, and in process of time obtained a good degree of favour with the duke, who sometimes would jest a little more broadly at my personage than I could well brook. For although I must acknowledge my stature to be so little as no man there is living I think less, yet, inasmuch as it was the work of God and not mine, he ought not to have made that a means to dishonour a gentleman withal. And those things which have happened unto me may be an example that great and wonderful things may be performed by most unlikely bodies, if the mind be good, and the blessing of our Lord do second and follow the endeavours of the same. Well, howsoever the Duke's merriments went against my stomach, I framed myself the best I could to dissemble my discontent, and by such my patience, accommodating myself also unto some other his humours, so when his favour as at his departure home into spain whither i attended him the year fifteen seventy three by his favour and some other accidents i will say nothing of my own industry wherein i was not wanting to myself i was able to carry home in my purse the value of three thousand crowns at my return home my parents that were marvelly displeased with my departure received me with great joy and the rather that they saw I brought with me means to maintain myself without their charge, having a portion sufficient of mine own, so that they needed not to defalk anything from my brethren or sisters for my setting up. But fearing I would spend it as lightly as I got it, they did never leave importuning me till I must marry the daughter of a Portuguese merchant of Lisbon, a man of great wealth and dealings, called John Figueres. Therein I satisfied their desire, and putting not only my marriage money, but also a good part of mine own stock, into the hands of my father-in-law, or such as he wished me unto, I lived in good sort, even like a gentleman, with great content, for divers years. At last it fell out that some disagreement happened between me and one Pedro Delgades, a gentleman of my kin, the causes whereof are needless to be related, but so far this dissension grew between us, as when no mediation of friends could appease the same into the fields we went together alone with our rapiers where my chance was to kill him being a man of great strength and tall stature but what i wanted of him in strength i supplied with courage and my nimbleness more than countervailed his stature this fact being committed in carmona i fled with all the speed i could to lisbon thinking to lurk with some friend of my father-in-law's till the matter might be compounded and a course taken for a sentence of acquittal by the consent of the prosecutors. This matter fell out in the year 1596, even at that time that a certain great count of ours came home from the West Indies in triumphant manner, boasting and sending out his declarations in print of a great victory he had obtained against the English, near the Isle of Pines. Whereas the truth is, he got of the English nothing at all in that voyage but blows and a great loss would to god that lying and vanity had been all the faults he had his covetousness was like to be my utter undoing but although since it hath proved a means of eternizing my fame and fame for ever with all posterity i verily hope and to the unspeakable good of all mortal men that in succeeding ages the world shall have if at the least wise it may please god that i do return safe home again into my country to give perfect instruction how those admirable devices and past all credit of possibility which i have light upon may be imparted unto public use you shall see men to fly from place to place in the air 
you shall be able, without moving or travelling of any creature, to send messages in an instant, many miles off, and receive answer again immediately. You shall be able to declare your mind presently unto your friend, being in some private and remote place of a populous city, with a number of such like things, but that which far surpasseth all the rest, you shall have notice of a new world, of many most rare and incredible secrets of nature, that all the philosophers of former ages could never so much as dream of. But I must be advised, how I be over-liberal in publishing these wonderful mysteries, till the sages of our state have considered how far the use of these things may stand with the policy and good government of our country, as also with the fathers of the church, how the publication of them may not prove prejudicial to the affairs of the Catholic faith and religion, which I am taught by those wonders I have seen above any mortal man that hath lived in many ages past, with all my best endeavours to advance, without all respect of temporal good, and so I hope I shall. But to go forward with my narration, so it was that the bragging captain above named made show of great discontentment for the death of the said Delgades, who was indeed some kin unto him, albeit he would have been entreated so that I would have given him no less than a thousand ducats for his share, to have put up his pipes and surceased all suit in his kinsman's behalf. I had by this time, besides a wife, two sons, whom I liked not to beggar by satisfying the desire of this covetous braggart of the rest, and therefore constrained of necessity to take another course, I put myself in a good carrick that went for the East Indies, taking with me the worth of two thousand ducats to traffic withal, being yet able to leave so much more for the estate of my wife and children, whatsoever might become of me, and the goods I carried with me. In the Indies I prospered exceeding well bestowing my stock in jewels, namely, for the most part in diamonds, emeralds, and great pearl, of which I had such pennyworths as my stock being safely returned into Spain, so I heard it was, must needs yield ten for one. But myself, upon my way homeward, soon after we had doubled the east of Buena Speranza, fell grievously sick for many days, making account by the same sickness to end my life, as undoubtedly I had done, had we not even then as we did, recovered that same blessed isle of St. Helens, the only paradise, I think, that the earth yieldeth. Of the healthfulness of the air there, the fruitfulness of the soil, and the abundance of all manner of things necessary for sustaining the life of man, what should I speak, seeing there is scant a boy in all Spain that hath not heard of the same? I cannot but wonder that our king in his wisdom hath not thought fit to plant a colony, and to fortify in it, being a place so necessary for refreshing of all travellers out of the Indies, so as it is hardly possible to make a voyage thence without touching there. It is situate in the altitude of sixteen degrees to the south, and is about three leagues in compass, having no firm land or continent within three hundred leagues, nay, not so much as an island within a hundred leagues of the same so that it may seem a miracle of nature that out of so huge and tempestuous an ocean such a little piece of ground should arise and discover itself. Upon the south side there is a very good harbour, and near unto the same diverse edifices built by the Portengiles to entertain passengers, amongst the which there is a pretty chapel, handsomely beautified with a tower, having a fair bell in the same. Near unto this housing there is a pretty brook of excellent fresh water, diverse fair walks made by hand, and set along upon both sides with fruit trees, especially oranges, lemons, pomegranates, almonds, and the like, which bear fruit all the year long, as do also the fig trees, vines, pear trees, whereof there are diverse sorts, palmitos, cocos, olives, plums. Also I have seen there such as we call Damoxellas, but few. As for apples, I dare say there are none at all. Of garden herbs there is good store, as of parsley, colworts, rosemary, melons, gourds, lettuce, and the like. Corn likewise groweth of itself, incredible plenty, as wheat, peas, barley, and almost all kinds of pulse. But chiefly it aboundeth with cattle and fowl as goats, swine, sheep, and horses, partridges, wild hens, pheasants, 
pigeons, and wild fowl, beyond all credit. Especially there are to be seen about the months of February and March huge flocks of a certain kind of wild swans, of which I shall have cause hereafter to speak more, that, like unto our cuckoos and nightingales, at a certain season of the year do vanish away and are no more to be seen. On this blessed island did they set me ashore with a negro to attend me, where, praise be God, I recovered my health and continued there for the space of one whole year, solacing myself for lack of human society with birds and brute beasts. As for Diego, so was the Blackmore called, he was constrained to live at the west end of the island in a cave, because, being always together, victuals would not have fallen out so plenty. If the hunting or fowling of the one had succeeded well, the other would find means to invite him, but if it were scant with both, we were fain both to bestir ourselves. Marry, that fell out very seldom, for that no creatures there do any whit more fear a man than they do a goat or a cow. By reason thereof, I found means easily to make tame diverse sorts both of birds and beasts, which I did in short time only by muzzling them, so as till they came either unto me or else Diego they could not feed. At first I took great pleasure in a kind of partridges, of which I made great use, as also of a tame fox I had. For whensoever I had any occasion to confer with Diego, I would take me one of them, being hungry, and tying a note about his neck, beat him from me. Whereupon straight they would away to the cave of Diego, and if they found him not there, still would they beat up and down all the west end of the island till they had hunted him out. Yet this kind of conveyance not being without some inconvenience, needless here to be recited, after a certain space I persuaded Diego, who, though he were a fellow of good parts, was ever content to be ruled by me, to remove his habitation unto a promontory or cape upon the northwest part of the island, being, though a league off, yet within sight of my house and chapel. And then, so long as the weather was fair, we could at all times, by signals, declare our minds each to other in an instant, either by night or by day which was the thing I took great pleasure in. If in the night season I would signify anything to him, I used to set up a light in the tower or place where our bell hung. It is a pretty large room, having a fair window, well glazed, and the walls, being well plastered, were exceeding white. By reason thereof, though the light were but small, it gave a great show, as also it would have done much further off, if need had been. This light, after I had let stand some half hour, I used to cover, and then, if I saw any signal of light again for my companion at the Cape, I knew that he waited for my notice, which perceiving, by hiding and showing my light, according to a certain rule and agreement between us, I certified him at pleasure what I list. The light course I took in the day to advertise him of my pleasures, sometimes by smoke, sometimes by dust sometimes by a more refined and effectual way. But this art containeth more mysteries than are to be set down in few words. Hereafter I will perhaps afford a discourse for it of purpose, assuring myself that it may prove exceedingly profitable unto mankind, being rightly used and well employed. For that which a messenger cannot perform in many days, this may dispatch in a piece of an hour. Well, I, notwithstanding after a while, grew weary of it, as being too painful for me, and betook me again to my winged messengers. Upon the seashore, especially about the mouth of a river, I found great store of a certain kind of wild swan, before mentioned, feeding almost altogether upon the prey, and that which is somewhat strange, partly of fish, partly of birds, having, which is also no less strange, one foot with claws, talons, and pounces like an eagle, and the other whole like a swan or waterfowl. These birds using to breed there in infinite numbers, I took some thirty or forty young ones of them, and bred them up by hand, partly for my recreation, partly also as having in my head some rudiments of that device which afterward I put in practice. These being strong and able to continue a great flight, I taught them first to come at call afar off, 
not using any noise but only the show of a white cloth and surely in them i found it true that is delivered by plutarch how that animalia carnivora they are dociliora quam alterius cuius vis generis it were a wonder to tell what tricks i had taught them by that time they were a quarter old amongst other things i used them by little and little to fly with burthens wherein i found them able above all credit and brought them to that pass as that a white sheet being displayed unto them by diego upon the side of a hill they would carry from me unto him bread flesh or any other thing i list to send and upon the like call return unto me again having prevailed thus far i began to cast in my head how i might do to join a number of them together in bearing of some great burthen which if i could bring to pass i might enable a man to fly and be carried in the air to some certain place was safe and without hurt in this cogitation having much laboured my wits and made some trial i found by experience that if many were put to the bearing of one great burthen by reason it was not possible all of them should rise together just in one instant the first that raised himself upon his wings finding himself stayed by a weight heavier than he could move or stir would by and by give over and also would the second third and all the rest i devised therefore at last a means how each of them might rise carrying but his own portion of weight only and it was thus i fastened about every one of my ganses a little pulley of cork and putting a string through it of meatly length i fastened the one end thereof unto a block almost of eight pound weight and to the other end of the string i tied a poise weighing some two pound which being done and causing the signal to be erected they presently rose all being four in number and carried away my block unto the place appointed this falling out according to my hope and desire i made proof afterwards but using the help of two or three birds more in a lamb whose happiness i much envied that he should be the first living creature to take possession of such a device at last after divers trials i was surprised with a great longing to cause myself to be carried in the like sort diego my moor was likewise possessed with the same desire and but that otherwise i loved him well and had need of his help i should have taken that his ambitious affection in very evil part for i hold it far more honour to have been the first flying man than to be another neptune that first adventured to sail upon the sea howbeit not seeming to take notice of the mark he aimed at i only told him which also i take to be true that all my ganses were not of sufficient strength to carry him being a man though of no great stature yet twice my weight at least so upon a time having provided all things necessary i placed myself with all my trinkets upon the top of a rock at the river's mouth and putting myself at full sea upon an engine the description whereof ensueth i caused diego to advance his signal whereupon my birds presently arose twenty-five in number and carried me over lustily to the other rock on the other side being about a quarter of a league the reason why I chose that time and place was that I thought somewhat might perchance fall out in this enterprise contrary to my expectation, in which case I assured myself the worst that could be was but to fall into the water, where being able to swim well I hoped to receive little or no hurt in my fall. But when I was once over in safety, oh, how did my heart even swell with joy and admiration of mine own invention! How often! did I wish myself in the midst of Spain, that speedily I might fill the world with the fame of my glory and renown. Every hour wished I with great longing for the Indian fleet to take me home with them, but they stayed, by what mischance I know not, three months beyond their accustomed time. At last they came, being in number three carracks sore weather-beaten, their people being for the most part sick and exceeding weak, so as they were constrained to refresh themselves on our island one whole month. The captain of our admiral was called Alfonso de Zima, a valiant man, wise and desirous of renown, and worthy better fortune than afterward befell him. Unto him I opened the device of my ganses, 
well knowing how impossible it were otherwise to persuade him to take in so many birds into the ship that it would be more troublesome for the niceness of provision to be made for them than so many men yet i adjured him by all manner of oaths and persuasions to afford me both true dealing and secrecy of the last i doubted not much as assuring myself he would not dare to impart the device to any other before our king were acquainted with it of the first i feared much more namely lest ambition and the desire of drawing unto himself the honour of such an invention should cause him to make me away yet i was forced to run the hazard except i would adventure the loss of my birds the like whereof for my purpose were not to be had in all christendom nor any that i could be sure would ever serve the turn well that doubt in proof fell out to be causeless the man i think was honest of himself but had he dealt treacherously with me i had laid a plot for the discovery of him as he might easily judge i would which peradventure somewhat moved him yet god knows how i might have used me before my arrival in spain if in the mean course we had not been intercepted as you shall hear upon thursday the twenty first of june to wit in the year fifteen ninety nine we set sail towards spain i having allowed me a very convenient cabin for my birds and stowage also for mine engine which the captain would have had me leave behind me and it is a marvel i had not but my good fortune therein saved my life and gave me that which i esteem more than an hundred lives if i had them for thus it fell out after two months sail we encountered with a fleet of the english some ten leagues from the island of teneric one of the canaries which is famous through the world for a hill upon the same called el pico that is to be discerned and kenned upon the sea no less than a hundred leagues off we had aboard us five times the number of people that they had we were well provided of munition and our men in good health yet seeing them disposed to fight and knowing what infinite riches we carried with us we thought it a wiser way to fly if we might than by encountering our company of dangerous fellows to hazard not only our own lives which a man of valour in such a case esteemeth not but the estates of many poor merchants who i am afraid were utterly undone by miscarriage of that business our fleet then consisted of five sail to wit three carracks a bark and a caravel that coming from the isle of st thomas had in an evil hour for him overtaken us some few days before the english had three ships very well appointed and no sooner spied but they began to play for us and changing their course as we might well perceive endeavoured straightway to bring us under their lee which they well might do as the wind stood especially being light nimble vessels and yar of sail as for the most part all the english shipping is whereas ours was heavy deep laden foul with the sea our captain therefore resolved peradventure wisely enough but i am sure neither valiantly nor fortunately to fly commanding us to disperse ourselves the caravel by reason of too much haste fell foul upon one of the carracks and bruised her so as one of the english that had undertaken her easily fetched her up and entered her as for the caravel she sank immediately in the sight of us all the bark for aught i could perceive no man making after her escaped unpursued and another of our carracks after some chase was given over by the english that making account to find a booty good enough of us and having us between them and their third companion made upon us with might and main wherefore our captain that was aboard us gave direction to run a land upon the isle the port whereof we could not recover saying that he hoped to save some of the goods and some of our lives and the rest he rather should be lost than commit all to the mercy of the enemy when i heard of that resolution seeing the sea to work high and knowing all the coast to be full of blind rocks and shoals so as our vessel might not possibly come near land before it must needs be rent in a thousand pieces i went unto the captain showing him the desperateness of the course he intended wishing him rather to try the mercy of the enemy than so to carry away himself and so many brave men but he would not hear me by any means whereupon discerning it to be high time to shift for myself first i sought out my box or little casket of stones and having put it into my sleeve i then betook me to my ganses put them upon my engine and myself upon it 
trusting, as indeed it happily fell out, that when the ship should split, my birds, although they wanted their signal, of themselves and for safeguard of their own lives, which nature hath taught every living creature to preserve to their power, would make towards the land, which fell out well, I thank God, according to mine expectation. The people of our ship marvelled about what I went, none of them being acquainted with the use of my birds, but the captain, for Diego was in the Rosaria, the ship that fled away unpursued, as told you before, some half a league we were taken from the land when our carracks strake upon a rock and split immediately, whereupon I let loose unto my birds the reins, having first placed myself upon the highest of the deck, and with the shock they all arose, carrying me fortunately unto the land, whereof, whether I were well appaid, you need not doubt, but a pitiful sight it was unto me to behold my friends and acquaintance in that miserable distress of whom notwithstanding many escaped better than they had any reason to hope for. For the English, launching out their cockboats, like men of more noble and generous disposition than we are pleased to esteem them, taking compassion upon them, used all the diligence they could to help such as had any means to save themselves from the fury of the waves, and that even with their own danger, amongst many they took up our captain, who, as Father Pacho could since tell me, having put himself into his cock with twelve others, was induced to yield himself unto one Captain Rimundo, who carried him, together with our pilot, along in their voyage with them, being bound for the East Indies. But their hard hap was by a breach of the sea near the Cape of Buona Esperanza, to be swallowed by the merciless waves, whose fury a little before they had so hardly escaped. The rest of them, as I likewise learned, and they were in all some twenty-six persons that they took into their ship, they set them a land soon after at Cape Verde. As for myself, being now ashore in a country inhabited for the most part by Spaniards, I reckoned myself in safety, albeit I quickly found the reckoning I so made mine host had not been acquainted with all, for it was my chance to pitch upon that part of the isle where the hill before mentioned beginneth to rise, and it is inhabited by a savage kind of people that live upon the sides of that hill, the top whereof is always covered with snow, and held, for the monstrous height and steepness, not to be accessible either for man or beast. Howbeit these savages, fearing the Spaniards, between whom and them there is a kind of continual war, hold themselves as near the top of that hill as they can, where they have divers places of good strength, never coming down into the fruitful valleys, but to prey upon what they can find there. It was the chance of a company of them to espy me, within some hours' space after my landing. They, thinking they had light upon a booty, made towards me with all the speed they could, but not so privily as that I could not perceive their purpose before they came near to me by half a quarter of a league seeing them come down the side of a hill with great speed directly towards me, divers of them carrying long staves, besides other weapons, which, because of their distance from me, I might not discern. I thought it high time to bestir me and shift for myself, and by all means to keep myself out of the fingers of such slaves, who, had they caught me, for the hatred they bear to us Spaniards, had surely hewed me to pieces. The country in that place was bare, without the coverture of any wood, but the mountain before spoken of, beginning even there to lift up itself, I espied in the side of the same a white cliff, which I trusted my ganses would take for a signal, and being put off, would make all that way, whereby I might quickly be carried so far as those barbarous cullions could not be able to overtake me before I had recovered the dwelling of some Spaniard or, at least wise, might have time to hide myself from them, till that, in the night, by help of the stars, I might guide myself towards Las Laguna, the city of that island, which was about one league off, as I think. Wherefore, with all the celerity that might be, I put myself upon mine engine, and let loose the reins unto my ganses. It was my good fortune that they took all one way, although not just that way I aimed at. But what then, O oh reader? <laughs> Arige aures, prepare thyself unto the hearing of the strangest chance that ever happened to any mortal man, 
and that I know thou wilt not have the grace to believe till thou see it seconded with iteration of experiments in the like, as many a one I trust thou mayest in short time. End of part one. Part two of The Man in the Moon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. The Man in the Moon by Francis Godwin. Part two. My ganses, like so many horses that had gotten the bit between their teeth, made, I say, not towards the cliff I aimed at, although I used my wanted means to direct the leader of the flock that way, but with might and main took up towards the top of El Pico and did never stay till they came there, a place where they say never man came before, being in all estimation at least fifteen leagues in height, perpendicularly upward, above the ordinary level of land and sea. What manner of place I found there, I should gladly relate unto you, but that I make haste to matters of far greater importance. There, when I was set down, I saw my poor ganses fall to panting and blowing, gaping for breath as if they would all presently have died. Wherefore I thought it not good to trouble them a while, forbearing to draw them in, which they were never wont to endure without struggling, and little expecting that which followed. It was now the season that these birds were wont to take their flight away, as our cuckoos and swallows do in Spain towards the autumn. They, as after I perceived, mindful of their usual voyage, even as I began to settle myself for the taking of them in, as it were with one consent rose up, and having no other place higher to make toward, to my unspeakable fear and amazement, struck bolt upright, and did never lean towering upward and still upward for the space, as I might guess, of one whole hour, toward the end of which time methought I might perceive them to labor less and less, till at length, Oh, incredible thing, they forbore moving anything at all, and yet remained unmovable and steadfastly as if they had been upon so many perches. The lines slacked, neither I nor the engines moved at all, but abode still as having no manner of weight. I found then by this experience that which no philosopher ever dreamed of, to wit that those things which we call heavy do not sink toward the center of the earth as their natural place, but as drawn by a secret property of the globe of the earth, or rather something within the same, in like sort as the lodestone draweth iron, being within the compass of the beams attractive. There, when I was set down, I saw my poor ganses fall to panting and blowing, gaping for breath as if they would all presently have died. Wherefore I thought it not good to trouble them a while, forbearing to draw them in, which they were never wont to endure without struggling, and little expecting that which followed. It was now the season that these birds were wont to take their flight away, as our cuckoos and swallows do in Spain towards the autumn. They, as after I perceived, mindful of their usual voyage, even as I began to settle myself for the taking of them in, as it were with one consent rose up, and having no other place higher to make toward, to my unspeakable fear and amazement, struck bolt upright, and did never lean towering upward and still upward for the space, as I might guess, of one whole hour, toward the end of which time methought I might perceive them to labor less and less, till at length, Oh, incredible thing, they forbore moving anything at all, and yet remained unmovable and steadfastly as if they had been upon so many perches. The lines slacked, neither I nor the engines moved at all, but abode still as having no manner of weight. I found then by this experience that which no philosopher ever dreamed of, to wit that those things which we call heavy do not sink toward the center of the earth as their natural place, but as drawn by a secret property of the globe of the earth, or rather something within the same, 
in like sort as the lodestone draweth iron, being within the compass of the beams attractive. For though it be true that they could abide unmoved without the prop or sustentation of any corporal thing other than the air, as easily and quietly as a fish in the middle of the water, yet forcing themselves never so little, it is not possible to imagine with what swiftness and celerity they were carried, and whether it were upward, downward, or sidelong, all was one. Truly, I must confess, the horror and amazement of that place was such as if I had not been armed with a true Spanish courage and resolution, I must needs have died there with very fear. But the next thing that did most trouble me was the swiftness of motion, such as did even stop my breath. If I should liken it to an arrow out of a bow, or to a stone cast down from the top of some high tower, it would come far short and short. Another thing there was exceeding, and more than exceeding, troublesome unto me, and that was the illusions of devils and wicked spirits, who, the first day of my arrival, came about me in great numbers, carrying the shapes and likeness of men and women, wondering at me, like so many birds about an owl, and speaking divers kinds of languages which I understood not, till at last I did light upon them that spake very good Spanish, some Dutch, and other some Italian for all these languages I understood. And here I saw only a touch of the sun's absence for a little while once, ever after having him in my sight. Now, to yield you satisfaction in the other, you shall understand that my ganses, although entangled in my lines, might easily find means to seize upon divers kinds of flies and birds, as especially swallows and cuckoos, whereof there were multitudes as motes in the sun although, to say the truth, I never saw them to feed anything at all. As for myself, in truth, I was much beholding unto those same, whether men or devils I know not, that amongst divers speeches, which I will forbear a while to relate, told me that if I would follow their directions, I should not only be brought safely to my home, but also be assured to have a command of all pleasures of that place at all times. To the which motions, not daring to make a flat denial, I prayed a time to think of it, and withal entreated them, though I felt no hunger at all, which may seem strange, to help me with some victuals, lest in the meanwhile I should starve. They did so, readily enough, and brought me very good flesh and fish, of divers sorts, well dressed, but that it was exceeding fresh, and without any manner of relish of salt. Wine also I tasted there, of divers sorts, as good as any in Spain, and beer no better in all Antwerp. They wished me then, while I had means, to make my provision, telling me that till the next Thursday they could not help me to any more, if happily then, at what time also they would find means to carry me back, and set me safe in Spain where I would wish to be, so that I would become one of their fraternity, and enter into such covenants and profession as they had made to their master and captain, whom they would not name. I answered them gently for the time, telling them I saw little reason to be very glad of such an offer, praying them to be mindful of me as occasion served. So that for that time I was rid of them, having first furnished my pockets with as much victual as I could thrust in, amongst the which I fail not to afford place for a little botillo of good canary wine. Now shall I declare unto you the quality of the place in which I then was. The clouds I perceived to be all under me, between me and the earth. The stars, by reason it was always day, I saw at all times alike, not shining bright, as upon the earth we are wont to see them in the night time, but of a whitish color, like that of the moon in the daytime with us and such of them as were to be seen, which were not many, I showed far greater than with us, yea, as I should guess, no less than ten times so great. As for the moon, being then within two days of the change, she appeared of a huge and fearful quantity. This also is not to be forgotten, that no stars appeared but on that part of the hemisphere that was next the moon, and the nearer to her, the bigger in quantity they showed. Again I must tell you that whether I lay quiet and rested, or else were carried in the air, 
I perceived myself still to be always directly between the moon and the earth, whereby it appeareth not only that my ganses took none other way than directly toward the moon, but also that when we rested, as at first we did for many hours, either we were insensibly carried, for I perceived no such motion, round about the globe of the earth, or else that, according to the late opinion of Copernicus, the earth is carried about and turneth round perpetually from west to east, leaving unto the planets only that motion which astronomers call natural, and is not upon the poles of the equinoctial, commonly termed the poles of the world, but upon those of the zodiac, concerning which question I will speak more hereafter, when I shall have leisure to call to my remembrance the astronomy that I learned being a young man at Salamanca, but have now <laughs> almost forgotten. The air in that place I found quiet, without any motion of wind, and exceeding temperate, neither hot nor cold, as where neither the sunbeams had any subject to reflect upon, neither was yet either the earth or water so near as to affect the air with their natural quality of coldness. As for that imagination of the philosophers attributing heat together with moistness unto the air, I never esteemed it otherwise than a fancy. Lastly, now it is to be remembered that after my departure from the earth, I never felt any appetite of hunger or thirst. Whether the purity of the air, our proper element, not being infected with any vapours of the earth and water, might yield nature sufficient nourishment, or what else might be the cause of it, I cannot tell. But so I found it, although I perceived myself in perfect health of body, having the use of my limbs and senses, and strength both of body and mind, rather beyond and above than anything short of the pitch or wanted vigour. Now let us go on, and on we shall go, more than a pace. Not many hours after the departure of that devilish company from me, my ganses began to bestir themselves, still directing their course toward the globe or body of the moon. And they made their way with that incredible swiftness, as I think they gained not so little as fifty leagues in every hour. In that passage I noted three things, very remarkable. One, that the further we went, the lesser the globe of the earth appeared unto us, whereas still on the contrary side the moon showed herself more and more monstrously huge. Again, the earth, which ever I held in mine eye, did as it were mask itself with a kind of brightness like another moon, and even as in the moon we discern certain spots or clouds, as it were, so did I then in the earth. But whereas the form of those spots in the moon continue constantly one at the same, these little and little did change every hour. The reason thereof I conceive to be this, that whereas the earth, according to her natural motion, for that such a motion she hath, I am now constrained to join an opinion with Copernicus, turneth round upon her own axe every twenty-four hours from the west to the east. I should at the first see the middle of the body of this new star, a spot, like unto a pear that has a morsel bitten out upon the one side of him. After certain hours I should see that spot slide away to the east side. This, no doubt, was the main of Afric. Then should I perceive a great shining brightness to occupy that room, during the like time, which was undoubtedly none other than the great Atlantic Ocean. After that succeeded a spot almost as an oval form, even just such as we see America to have in our maps. Then another vast clearness representing the West Ocean, and lastly a medley of spots like the countries of the East Indies. So that it seemed unto me no other than a huge mathematical globe leisurely turned before me, wherein successively all the countries of our earthly world within the compass of twenty-four hours were represented to my sight. And this was all the means I had now to number the days and take reckoning of time. Philosophers and mathematicians, I would, should now confess the willfulness of their own blindness. They have made the world believe hitherto that the earth hath no motion, and to make that good they are fain to attribute unto all and every of the celestial bodies two motions, quite contrary each to other, 
whereof one is from the east to the west to be performed in twenty-four hours that they imagine to be forced per raptum prime mobilis the other from the west to the east in several proportions oh incredible thing that those same huge bodies of the fixed stars in the highest globe whereof divers are by themselves confessed to be more than one hundredth times as big as the whole earth should as so many nails in a cartwheel be whirled about in that short space whereas it is many thousands of years no less i trow they say than thirty thousand before that orb do finish his course from west to east which they call the natural motion now whereas to every of these they yield their natural course from east to west therein they do well the moon performeth it in twenty-seven days the sun venus and mercury in a year or thereabouts mars in three year jupiter in twelve years and saturn in thirty but to attribute to these celestial bodies contrary motions at once was a very absurd conceit and much more to imagine that same orb wherein the fixed stars are whose natural course taketh so many thousands of years should every twenty-four hours be turned about i will not go so far as copernicus that maketh the sun the centre of the earth and unmovable neither will i define anything one way or other only this i say allow the earth is motion which these eyes of mine can testify to be as due and these absurdities are quite taken away every one having his single and proper motion only but where am i at the first i promised in history and i fall into disputes before i am aware there is yet one accident more befell me worthy of a special remembrance that during the time of my stay i saw as it were a kind of cloud of reddish colour growing toward me which continually growing nearer and nearer at last i perceived to be nothing else but a huge swarm of locusts he that readeth the discourses of learned men concerning them and namely that of john leo in his description of afric how that they are seen in the air many days before they fall upon a country adding unto that which they deliver this experience of mine will easily conclude that they cannot come from any other place than the globe of the moon but give me leave now at last to pass on my journey quietly without interruption for eleven or twelve days during all which time i was carried directly toward the globe or body of the moon with such violent whirling as cannot be expressed for i cannot imagine that a bullet out of the mouth of a cannon could make way through the vaporous and muddy air near the earth with that celerity which is most strange considering that my ganses moved their wings but even now and then and sometimes not at all in a quarter of an hour together only they held them stretched out so passing on as we see that eagles and kites sometimes will do for a little space when as one speaks i remember contabundo volato pene eodem loco pendula circumventur and during the time of those pauses i believe they took their naps and times of sleeping for other as i might easily note they had none now for myself i was so fast knit unto my engine as i durst commit myself to slumbering enough to serve my turn which i took with as great ease although i am loath to speak it because it may seem incredible as if i had been in the best bed of down in all antwerp after eleven days passage in this violent flight i perceived that we began to approach near unto another earth if i may so call it being the globe or very body of that star which we call the moon the first difference that i found between it and our earth was that it showed itself in his natural colours ever after i was free from the attraction of the earth whereas with us a thing removed from our eye but a league or two begins to put on that lurid and deadly colour of blue then i perceived also that it was covered for the most part with a huge and mighty sea those parts only being dry land which show unto us here somewhat darker than the rest of her body that i mean which the country people call el hombre de la luna the man of the moon as for that part which shineth so clearly in our eyes it is even another ocean yet besprinkled here and there with islands which for the littleness so far off we cannot discern so that same splendour appearing unto us and giving light unto our night appeareth to be nothing else but the reflection of the sunbeams returned unto us out of the water as out of a glass 
how ill this agreeth with that which our philosophers teach in the schools, I am not ignorant. But alas, how many of their errors hath time and experience refuted in this our age, with the recital whereof I will not stand to trouble the reader. Amongst many other of their vain surmises, the time and order of my narration putteth me in mind of one which now my experience found most untrue. Who is there that hath not hitherto believed the uppermost region of the air to be extreme hot, as being next forsooth under the natural place of the element of fire? O oh, vanities, fancies, dreams! After the time I was once quite free from the attractive beams of that tyrannous lodestone the earth, I found the air of one of the self-same temper, without winds, without rain, without mists, without clouds, neither hot nor cold, but continually, after one and the same tenor, most pleasant, mild, and comfortable, till my arrival in that new world of the moon. As for that region of fire our philosophers talk of, I heard no news of it. Mine eyes have sufficiently informed me that there can be no such thing. The earth, by turning about, had now showed me all her parts twelve times, when I finished my course. For when by my reckoning it seemed to be, as indeed it was Tuesday, the eleventh day of September, at which time the moon, being two days old, was in the twentieth degree of Libra, my ganses stayed at their course as it was with one consent, and took their rest for certain hours. After which they took their flight, and within less than one hour set me upon the top of a very high hill in that other world, where immediately were presented unto mine eyes many most strange and unwanted sights. For first I observed that although the globe of the earth showed much bigger there than the moon doth unto us, even to the full trebling of her diameter, yet all manner of things were here of largeness and quantity, ten, twenty, I think I may say thirty times more than ours. Their trees at least three times so high as ours, and more than five times the breadth and thickness. So their herbs, beasts, and birds. Although to compare them with ours I know not well how, because I found not anything there, any species either of beast or bird, that resembled ours anything at all, except swallows, nightingales, cuckoos, woodcocks, bats, and some kinds of fowl, as also such birds as my ganses, all which, as now I well perceived, spend the time of their absence from us even there in that world. Neither do they vary anything at all, either in quantity or quality from those of ours here, as being none other than the very same, and not only specie, but numero. But of these novelties, more hereafter in their due places. No sooner was I set down upon the ground, but I was surprised with a most ravenous hunger and earnest desire of eating. Wherefore, stepping unto the next tree, I fastened there into my engine with my ganses, and in great haste fell to searching of my pockets for the victuals I had reserved as aforesaid. But to my great amazement and discomfort I found instead of partridge and capon, which I thought to have put there, a mingle-mangle of dry leaves, of goat's hair, sheep, and goat's dung, moss, and such like trash. As for my canary wine, it was turned into a stinking and filthy kind of liquor like the urine of some beast. Oh, the illusions of wicked spirits, whose help if I had been fain only to rely upon, you see how I had been served. Now while I stood musing and wondering at this strange metamorphosis, I heard my ganses upon the sudden to make a great fluttering behind me, and looking back I espied them to fall greedily upon a certain shrub within the compass of their lines, whose leaves they fed upon most earnestly, where heretofore I had never seen them to eat any manner of green meat whatsoever. Whereupon, stepping to the shrub, I put a leaf of it between my teeth. I cannot express the pleasure I found in the taste thereof. Such it was. I am sure, as if I had not with great discretion moderated my appetite, I had surely surfeited upon the same. In the meantime, it fell out to be a bait that well contented both my birds and me at that time, when we had need of some good refreshing. Scarcely had I ended this banquet, when, upon the sudden, I saw myself environed with a kind of people most strange, both for their feature, demeanour, 
and apparel. Their stature was most diverse, but for the most part twice the height of ours, their color and countenance most pleasing, and their habits such as I know not how to express. For neither did I see any kind of cloth, silk, or other stuff to resemble the matter of that whereof their clothes were made, neither, which is most strange of all other, can I devise how to describe the color of them, being in a manner all clothed alike. It was neither black, nor white, yellow, nor red, green, nor blue, nor any color composed of these. But if you ask me what it was, then, I must tell you, it was a color never seen in our earthly world, and therefore neither to be described unto us by any, nor to be conceived of one that never saw it. For, as it were a hard matter to describe unto a man born blind, the difference between blue and green, so I cannot bethink myself any mean how to decipher unto you this lunar color, having no affinity with any color that ever I beheld with mine eyes. Only this I can say of it, that it was the most glorious and delightful that can possibly be imagined. Neither in truth was there anything that more delighted me during my abode in that new world than the beholding of that most pleasing and resplendent color. It remaineth now that I speak of the demeanour of this people, who, presenting themselves unto me upon the sudden, and that in such extraordinary fashion as I have declared, being strucken with great amazement, I crossed myself and cried out, Jesus Maria. No sooner was the word Jesus out of my mouth, but young and old fell all down upon their knees, at which I not a little rejoiced, holding up both their hands on high, and repeating all certain words which I understood not. Then presently they all arising, one that was far the tallest of them came unto me and embraced me with great kindness, and giving order as I partly perceived unto some of the rest to stay by my birds, he took me by the hand, and leading me down toward the foot of the hill, brought me to his dwelling, being more than half a league from the place where I first alighted. It was such a building for beauty and hugeness as all our world cannot show any near comparable to it. Yet such I saw afterwards elsewhere, as this might seem but a cottage in respect to them. There was not a door about the house that was not thirty foot high, and twelve in breadth. The rooms were between forty and fifty foot in height, and so all other proportions answerable. Neither could they well be much less, the master inhabiting them being full twenty-eight high. As for his corporature, I suppose verily that if we had him here in this world to be weighed in the balance, the poise of his body would show itself more ponderous than five and twenty, peradventure thirty of ours. After I had rested myself with him, the value of one of our days, he led me some five leagues off unto the palace of the prince of the country. The stateliness of the building whereof I will leave unto the second part of this work, as also many other particulars which will minister more pleasure to the reader than yet I may afford him, being desirous in this first part to set down no more than what the process of my story concerning my journey doth necessarily draw from me. This prince, whose stature was much higher than the former, is called, as near as I can by letters declare it, for their sounds are not perfectly to be expressed by our characters, Pylonas, which signifieth in their language first if perhaps it be not rather a denotation of his dignity and authority as being the prime man in all those parts in all those parts i say for there is one supreme monarch amongst them of stature yet much more huge than he commanding over all that whole orb of that world having under him twenty-nine other princes of exceeding great power and every of them twenty-four others whereof this pylonus was one the first ancestor of this great monarch came out of the earth as they deliver and by marriage with the inheritress of that huge monarchy obtaining the government left it unto his posterity who ever since have held the same even for the space of forty thousand days or moons which amounteth unto three thousand seventy seven years and his name being irdonazur his heirs unto this day do all assume unto themselves that name he, they say, having continued there well near four hundred moons, and having begotten diverse children, returned, by what means they declare not, 
unto the earth again. I doubt not, but they may have their fables as well as we. And because our histories afford no mention of any earthly man to have ever been in that world before myself, and much less to have returned thence again, I cannot but condemn that tradition for false and fabulous. Yet this I must tell you, that learning seemeth to be in great estimation among them, and that they make semblance of detesting all lying and falsehood, which is one there to be severely punished. Again, which may yield some countenance under their historical narrations, many of them live wonderful long, even beyond all credit, to wit, even to the age, as they profess to me, of thirty thousand moons, which amounteth unto a thousand years and upwards, so that the ages of three or four men might well reach unto the time of the first Erdonazor. And this is noted generally, that the taller people are of stature, the more excellent they are for all endowments of mind, and the longer time they do live. For when as that which before I partly intimated unto you, their stature is most diverse, great numbers of them little exceeding ours. Such seldom live above the age of a thousand moons, which is answerable to eighty of our years, and they account them most base creatures, even but a degree before brute beasts, employing them accordingly in all the basest and most servile offices, terming them by a word that signifieth bastard men, counterfeits, or changelings. So those whom they account genuine, natural, and true lunars, both in quantity of body and length of life, they have for the most part thirty times as much as we, which proportion agreeeth well with the quantity of the day in both worlds, theirs containing almost thirty of ours. Now when I shall declare unto you the manner of our travel under the palace of Pylonus, you will say you scarce ever heard anything more strange and incredible. Unto every one of us there was delivered, at our first setting forth, two fans of feathers, not much unlike to those that our ladies do carry in Spain, to make a cool air unto themselves in the heat of summer. The use of which fans before I declare unto you, I must let you understand that the globe of the moon is not altogether destitute of an attractive power, but it is so far weaker than that of the earth, as if a man do but spring upward with all his force, as dancers do when they show their activity by capering, he shall be able to mount fifty or sixty foot high, and then he is quite beyond all attraction of the moon's earth, falling down no more. So as, by the help of these fans, as with wings, they convey themselves in the air in a short space, although not with that swiftness that birds do, even whither they list. In two hours' space, as I could guess by the help of these fans, we were carried through the air those five leagues, being about sixty persons. Being arrived at the palace of Pylonus, after our conductor had gotten audience, which was not presently, and had declared what manner of present he had brought, I was immediately called in unto him by his attendants. The stateliness of his palace, and the reverence done unto him, I soon discerned his greatness, and therefore framed myself to win his favour the best I might. You may remember I told you of a certain little box or casket of jewels, the remainder of those which, being brought out of the East Indies, I sent from Isle of St. Helen unto Spain. These, before I was carried in unto him, I took out of my pocket in a corner, and making choice of some of every sort, made them ready to be presented as I should think fit. I found him sitting in a most magnificent chair of estate, having his wife or queen upon one hand and his eldest son on the other, which both were attended, the one by a troop of ladies, and the other of young men, and all along the side of the room stood a great number of goodly personages, whereof scarce any one was lower of stature than Pylonus, whose age they say is now twenty-one thousand moons. At my first entrance, falling down upon my knees, I thought good to use unto him these words in the Latin tongue, Propitius fit tibi princeps illustrissime dominus nostra Jesus Christus, etc. As the people I first met with all, so they, hearing the holy name of our Saviour, they all, I say, king, queen, and all the rest fell down upon their knees, pronouncing a word or two I understood not. They being risen again, I proceeded thus, Et Maria Salvatoris Generix, Petrus, et Paulus, 
etc. And so, reckoning up the number of saints to see if there were any one of them that they honoured as their patron, at last reckoning among others Saint Martinus, they all bowed their bodies, and held up hands in sign of great reverence, the reason whereof I learned to be that Martin, in their language, signifieth God. Then, taking out my jewels, prepared for that purpose, I presented unto the king or prince, call him how you please, seven stones of so many several sorts, a diamond, a ruby, an emerald, a sapphire, a topaz, a turquoise, and an opal, which he accepted with great joy and admiration, as having not often seen any such before. Then I offered unto the queen and prince some other, and was about to have bestowed a number of more upon another there present, but Pylonus forbade them to accept, thinking, as afterwards I learned, that they were all I had, and being willing they should be reserved for Irinazor, his sovereign. This done, he embraced me with great kindness, and began to inquire of me divers things by signs, which I likewise answered by signs as well as I could. But not being able to give him content, he delivered me to a guard of a one hundred of his giants, so I may well call them, commanding straightly, first, that I should want nothing that might be fit for me, secondly, that they should not suffer any of the dwarf lunars, if I may so term them, to come near me, thirdly, that I should, with all diligence, to be instructed in their language, and lastly, that by no means they should impart unto me the knowledge of certain things, particularly by him specified. Marry, what those particulars were, I might never by any means get knowledge. It may be now you will desire to understand what were the things Pylonus inquired of me. Why, what were these? Whence I came, how I arrived there, and by what means? What was my name, what was my errand, and such like? To all which I answered the very truth as near as I could. Being dismissed, I was afforded all manner of necessaries that my heart could wish, so as it seemed unto me I was in a very paradise, and therefore being willing to foster any small spark of hope of my return, with great diligence I took order for the attendance of my birds, I mean my ganses, whom myself in person tended every day with great carefulness all which notwithstanding had fallen out to little purpose had not other men's care performed that which no endeavour of mine own could end of part two part three of the man in the moon this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland the Man in the Moon by Francis Godwin, Part Three. For the time now approached, when of necessity all the people of our stature, and so myself among the rest, must needs sleep for some thirteen or fourteen whole days together. So it cometh to pass there by a secret power and unresistible degree of nature, that when the day beginneth to appear, and the moon to be enlightened by the sunbeams, which is at the first quarter of the moon, all such people as exceed not very much our stature inhabiting those parts, they fall into a dead sleep, and are not possibly to be awakened till the sun be set, and withdrawn out of their sight. Even as owls and bats with us cannot endure the light, so we see there, at the first approach of the day, begin to be amazed with it, and fall immediately into a slumber which groweth by little and little into a dead sleep, till this light depart from thence again, which is not in fourteen or fifteen days, to wit, until the last quarter. It thinks now I hear some man to demand what manner of light there is in that world during the absence of the sun. To resolve you for that point, you shall understand that there is a light of two sorts, one of the sun which I might not endure to behold, and another of the earth that of the earth was now at the highest, for that when the moon is in the change, then is the earth, under them in the moon, like a full moon with us, and as the moon increaseth with us, so the light of the earth decreaseth with them. I then found the light there, though the sun were absent, equal unto that with us in the daytime, when the sun is covered with clouds, 
but toward the quarter it little and little diminisheth, yet leaving still a competent light, which is somewhat strange. But much stranger is that which was reported unto me there, how that in the other hemisphere of the moon, I mean contrary to that I happened upon, where during half the moon they see not the sun, and the earth never appeareth unto them, they have notwithstanding a kind of light, not unlike by their description to our moonlight, which it seemeth the propinquity of the stars and other planets, so much nearer unto them than us, affordeth. Now you shall understand that of the true lunars there be three degrees, some beyond the pitch of our stature a good deal, as perhaps ten or twelve foot high, that can endure the day of the moon, when the earth shineth but little, but not endure the beams of both. At such time they must be content to be laid asleep. Others there are of twenty foot high, or somewhat more, that in ordinary places endure all light, both of earth and sun. Mary, there is a certain island, the mysteries whereof none may know, whose stature is not at least twenty-seven foot high, I mean, of the measure of the standard of Castile. If any other come aland there in the moon's daytime, they fall asleep immediately. This island they call God's Island, or Insula Martini, in their language. They say it hath a particular governor, who is, as they report, of age sixty-five thousand moons, which amounteth to five thousand of our years. His name is said to be Hiruch, and he commandeth after a sort over Idinosaur himself, especially in that island out of which he never cometh. There is another repairing much thither, they say is half his age and upwards, to wit about thirty-three thousand moons, or twenty-six hundred of our years. And he commandeth in all things, throughout the whole globe of the moon, concerning matters of religion, and the service of God, as absolutely as our Holy Father the Pope doth in any part of Italy. I would fain have seen this man, but I might not be suffered to come near him. His name is Emoses. Now give me leave to settle myself to a long night's sleep. My attendants take charge of my birds, prepare my lodging, and signify to me by signs how it must be with me. It was about the middle of September when I perceived the air to grow more clear than ordinary, and with the increasing of the light I began to feel myself first dull, then heavy, and willing to sleep, although I had not lately been hindered from taking mine ease that way. I delivered myself at last into the custody of this sister of death, whose prisoner I was for almost a fortnight after. Awaking then, it is not to be believed how fresh, how nimble, how vigorous I found all the faculties, both of my body and mind. In good time, therefore, I settled myself immediately to the learning of the language, which, a marvellous thing to consider, is one of the same throughout all the regions of the moon, yet so much the less to be wondered at, because I cannot think all the earth of moon to amount to the fortieth part of our inhabited earth, partly because the globe of the moon is much less than that of the earth, and partly because their sea or ocean covereth in estimation three parts of four, if not more, whereas the superficies of our land may be judged equivalent and comparable in measure to that of our seas. The difficulty of that language is not to be conceived, and the reasons thereof are especially two. First, because it hath no affinity with any other that ever I heard. Secondly, because it consisteth not so much of words and letters as of tunes and uncouth sounds that no letters can express. For you have few words, but they signify diverse and several things, and they are distinguished only by their tunes that are, as it were, sung in the utterance of them. Yea, many words there are consisting of tunes only, so as if they list they will utter their minds by tunes without words. For example, they have an ordinary salutation among them, signifying, verbatim, Glory be to God alone, which they express, as I take it, for I am no perfect musician, by this tune without any words at all. Bum, 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 bum. 
yea, the very names of men they will express in the same sort. When they were disposed to talk of me before my face, so as I should not perceive it, this was Gonzales. Bum, 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 bum. By occasion hereof I discern means of framing a language, and that easy soon to be learned, as copious as any other in the world, consisting of tunes only, whereof my friends may know more at leisure as it please them. This is a great mystery, and worthier the searching after than at first you would imagine. Now notwithstanding the difficulty of this language, within two months' space I had attained unto such knowledge of the same as I understand most questions to be demanded of me, and what with signs and what with words make reasonable shift to utter my mind, which thing being certified unto Pylonus, he sent for me oftentimes, and would be pleased to give me knowledge of many things that my guardians durst not declare unto me. Yet this I will say of them, that they never abused me with any untruth that I could perceive, but if I asked a question that they liked not to resolve me in, they would shake their heads, and with a Spanish shrug pass over to other talk. After seven months' space, it happened that the great Irinazor, making his progress to a place some two hundred leagues distant from the place of Pylonus, sent for me. The history of that journey, and the conference that passed between us, shall be related at large in my second book. Only thus much thereof at this time, that he would not admit me into his presence, but talked with me through a window, where I might hear him, and he both hear and see me at pleasure. I offered him the remainder of my jewels, which he accepted very thankfully, telling me that he would requite them with gifts of another manner of value. It was not above a quarter of a moon that I stayed there, before I was sent back unto Pylonus again, and so much the sooner, because if we had stayed but a day or two longer, the sun would have overtaken us before we could have recovered our home. The gifts he bestowed on me were such as a man would forsake mountains of gold for and they were all stones, to wit nine in number, and those of three sorts, whereof one they called Pelastus, another Macrus, and third Ebelus, of each sort three. The first are of the bigness of a hazelnut, very like unto jet, which among many other incredible virtues hath this property, that being once heat in the fire, they ever after retain their heat, though without any appearance, until they be quenched, with some kind of liquor, whereby they receive no detriment at all, though they be heat and quenched ten thousand times. And their heat is so vehement as they make red hot any metal that shall come within a foot of them, and being put in a chimney will make a room as warm as if a great fire were kindled in the same. The macrus, yet far more precious than the other, is of the color of topaz, so shining and resplendent, as, though not past the bigness of a bean, Yet, being placed in the midst of a large church in the night-time, it maketh it all light, as if a hundred lamps were hanged up round about it. Can you wish for properties in a stone of greater use than these? Yes, my Ebelus will afford you that which I dare say will make you prefer him before these. Yea, and all diamonds, sapphires, rubies, and emeralds that our world can yield, were they laid in a heap before you. To say nothing of the colour, the lunar, whereof I made mention before, which notwithstanding is so incredibly beautiful as a man should travel a thousand leagues to behold it, the shape is somewhat flat, of the breadth of a pistolet, and twice the thickness. The one side of this, which is somewhat more orient of colour than the other, being clapped to the bare skin of a man in any part of his body, it taketh away from it all weight or ponderousness, whereas, turning the other side, it addeth force unto the attractive beams of the earth, either in this world or that, and maketh the body to weigh half so much again as it did before. Do you marvel now why I should so overprize this stone? Before you see me on earth again, you shall understand more of the value of this kind and unvaluable gem. I inquired amongst them, whether they had not any kind of jewel or other means to make a man invisible, which methought had been a thing of great and extraordinary use. 
and I could tell that divers of our learned men had written many things to that purpose. They answered that if it were a thing feasible, yet they assured themselves that God would not suffer it to be revealed to us creatures subject to so many imperfections, being a thing so apt to be abused to ill purposes, and that was all I could get of them. Now, after it was known that Irdenazor, the great monarch, had done me this honor, it is strange how much all men respected me more than before. My guardians, which hitherto were very nice in relating anything to me concerning the government of that world, now became somewhat more open, so as I could learn, partly of them and partly of Pylonus, what I shall deliver unto you concerning that matter, whereof I will only give you a taste at this time, referring you unto a more ample discourse in my second part, which at my return into Spain you shall have at large, but not till then, for causes heretofore related. In a thousand years it is not found that there is either whoremonger amongst them, whereof these reasons are to be yielded. There is no want of anything necessary for the use of man. Food groweth everywhere without labor, and that of all sorts to be desired. For raiment, housing, or anything else that you may imagine possible for a man to want or desire, it is provided by the command of superiors, though not without labor, yet so little as they do nothing but as it were playing and with pleasure again their females are all of an absolute beauty and i know not how it cometh to pass by a secret disposition of nature there that a man having once known a woman never desireth any other as for murder it was never heard of amongst them neither is it a thing almost possible to be committed for there is no wound to be given which may not be cured they assured me and I for my part do believe it, that although a man's head be cut off, yet if any time within the space of three moons it be put together, and joined to the carcass again, with the appointment of the juice of a certain herb there growing, it will be joined together again, so as the party wounded shall become perfectly whole in a few hours. But the chief cause is that through an excellent disposition of that nature of people there, all young and old do hate all manner of vice and do live in such love peace and amity as it seemeth to be another paradise true it is that some are better disposed than other but that they discern immediately at the time of their birth and because it is an inviolable decree amongst them never to put any one to death perceiving by the stature and some other notes they have who are likely to be of a wicked or imperfect disposition they send them away, I know not by what means, into the earth, and change them for other children, before they shall have either ability or opportunity to do amiss among them. But first, they say, they are fain to keep them there for a certain space, till that the air of our earth may alter their color to be like unto ours. And their ordinary vent for them is a certain high hill in the north of America, whose people I can easily believe to be wholly descended of them, partly in regard of their color, partly also in regard of the continual use of tobacco, which the lunars use exceeding much, as living in a place abounding wonderfully with moisture, as also for the pleasure they take in it, and partly in some other respects too long now to be rehearsed. Sometimes they mistake their aim and fall upon Christendom, Asia or Afric, marry it is but seldom, I remember some years since that I read certain stories tending to the confirmation of these things delivered by these lunars, as especially one chapter of Gil Nibrigensis Edureb Angel. It is toward the end of the first book, but the chapter I cannot particularly resign. Then see Inigo Mondejar in his description of Nueva Granata, the second book, as also Josef de Cia de Carana in his history of Mexico. If my memory fail me not, you will find that in these, which will make my report much the more credible. But for testimonies I care not. May I once have the happiness to return home in safety, I will yield such demonstrations of all I deliver, as shall quickly make void all doubt of the truth thereof. If you will ask me further of the manner of government amongst the lunars, and how justice is executed, oh, alas, what need is there of exemplary punishment? where there are no offences committed. They need there no lawyers, for there is never any contention. 
the seeds thereof, if any begin to sprout, being presently by the wisdom of the next superior pulled up by the roots. And as little need is there of physicians. They never misdiet themselves. Their air is always temperate and pure. Neither is there any occasion at all of sickness, as to me it seemed at least, for I could not hear that ever any of them were sick. But the time that nature hath assigned unto them being spent, without any pain at all they die, or, or rather, I should say, cease to live, as a candle to give light when that which nourisheth it is consumed. I was once at the departure of one of them, which I wondered much to behold, for notwithstanding the happy life he led, and multitude of friends and children he should forsake, as soon as certainly he understood and perceived his end to approach, he prepared a great feast, and calling about him all those he especially esteemed of, he bids them be merry and rejoice with him, for that the time was come he should now leave the counterfeit pleasures of that world, and be made partaker of all true joys and perfect happiness. I wondered not so much at his constancy as the behavior of those his friends. With us, in the like case, all seem to mourn, when often some of them do but laugh in their sleeves, or, as one says, under a visored. They all, on the other side, young and old, both seemingly and in my conscience sincerely, did rejoice thereat, so as if any dissembled, it was but their own grief conceived for their own particular loss. Their bodies, being dead, putrefy not, and therefore are not buried, but kept in certain rooms ordained for that purpose, so as most of them can show their ancestors' bodies uncorrupt for many generations. There is never any rain, wind, or change of the air, never either summer or winter, but as it were a perpetual spring, yielding all pleasure, all content, and that free from any annoyance at all. Oh, my wife and children, what wrong have you done me to bereave me of the happiness of that place, but it maketh no matter. For by this voyage am I sufficiently assured that ere long the race of my mortal life being run, I shall attain a greater happiness elsewhere, and that everlasting. It was the ninth day of September that I began to ascend from El Pico. Twelve days I was upon my voyage, and arrived in that region of the moon that they call Simiri, September the 21st following. The twelfth day of May being Friday, we came unto the court of the great Irdanazor, and returned back the seventeenth, under the palace of Pylonus. There I continued till the month of March, in the year 1601. At that time I earnestly besought Pylonus, as I had often done before, to give me leave to depart, though with never so great hazard of my life, back into the earth again. He much dissuaded me, laying before me the danger of the voyage, the misery of that place from whence I came, and the abundant happiness of that I was now in. But the remembrance of my wife and children overweighed all these reasons, and, to tell you the truth, I was so far forth moved with a desire of that deserved glory that I might purchase at my return, as methought I deserved not the name of Spaniard if I would not hazard twenty lives rather than lose but a little possibility of the same. Wherefore, I answered him, that my desire of seeing my children was such as I knew I could not live any longer if I were once out of hope of the same. When then he desired one year's stay longer, I told him it was manifest I must depart now or never. My birds began to droop for want of their wanted migration. Three of them were now dead, and if a few more failed, I, I was forever destitute of all possibility of returning. With much ado, at last he condescended unto my request, having first acquainted the great Irdanazor with my desire, then perceiving by the often baying of my birds a great longing in them to take their flight, I trimmed up my engine and took my leave of Pylonus, who, for all the courtesy he had done me, required of me but one thing, which was faithfully to promise him that if ever I had means thereunto, I should salute from him Elizabeth, whom he termed the great Queen of England, calling her the most glorious of all women living. And, indeed, he would often question with me of her, and therein delighted so much, as it seemed he was never satisfied in talking of her. He also delivered unto me a token, or present for her, of no small value. Though I account her an enemy of Spain, I may not fail of performing this promise as soon as I shall be able so to do. Upon the twenty-ninth day of March, being Thursday, three days after my awakening from the moon's light, I fastened myself to mine engine, 
not forgetting to take with me, besides the jewels Irdenazor had given me, with whose use and virtues Pylonus had acquainted me at large, a small quantity of victual, wherefore afterward I had great use, as shall be declared. An infinite multitude of people, and amongst the rest Pylonus himself, being present, after I had given him the last Bezalus Manos, I let loose the reins into my birds, who with great greediness taking wing quickly carried me out of their sight. It fell out with me, as in my first passage. I never felt either hunger or thirst till I arrived in China, upon a high mountain, some five leagues from the high and mighty city of Pachi. This voyage was performed in less than nine days. I heard no news, by the way, of these airy men which I had seen in my ascending. No thing stayed my journey any whit at all, whether it was the earnest desire of my birds to return to the earth, where they had missed one season, or that the attraction of the earth so much stronger than that of the moon furthered their labor, so it came to pass, although now I had three birds wanting of those I carried forth with me. For the first eight days my birds flew before, and I, with the engine, was, as it were, drawn by them. The ninth day, when I began to approach under the clouds, I perceived myself and my engine to sink towards the earth and go before them. I was then horribly afraid, lest my birds, not being able to bear our weight, they being so few, should be constrained to precipitate both me and themselves headlong to the earth. Wherefore I thought it no less than needful to make use of the ebulus, one of the stones bestowed upon me by Irdenazor, which I clapped to my bare flesh within my hose, and it appeared manifestly thereupon unto me that my birds made their way with much greater ease than before, as being lightened of a great burthen. Neither do I think it possible for them to have let me down safely unto the earth without that help. China is a country so populous as I think there is hardly a piece of ground to be found in the most barren parts of the same, though but thrice a man's length which is not most carefully manured. I being yet in the air, some of the country people had espied me and came running unto me by troops. They seized upon me and would needs by and by carry me unto an officer. I, seeing no other remedy, yielded myself unto them. But when I essayed to go, I found myself so light that I had much ado, one foot peeing upon the ground, to set down the other. That was by reason of my ebulus, so applied as it took quite away all weight and ponderousness from my body. Wherefore, bethinking myself what was to be done, I feigned a desire performing the necessity of nature, which by signs made known unto them, for they understood not a word of any language I could speak, they permitted me to go aside among a few bushes, assuring themselves that for me to escape from them was impossible. Being there, I remembered the directions Hylonus had given me concerning the use of my stones, and first I took them all together, with a few jewels yet remaining of those I had brought out of India, and knit them up in my handkerchief, all except one, the least and worst ebulus. Him I found means to apply in such sort unto my body, as but the half of his side touched my skin, whereby it came to pass that my body then had but half the weight. That being done, I drew towards these my guardians, till seeing them come somewhat near together, they could not cross my way. I showed them a fair pair of heels. This I did to the end I might recover an opportunity of finding my stones and jewels, which I knew they would rob me of if I prevented them not. Being thus lightened, I bid them such a base as had they been all upon the backs of so many zebras, they could never have overtaken me. I directed my course unto a certain thick wood, into which I entered some a quarter of league, and then finding a pretty spring, which I took for my mark, hard by it, I thrust my jewels into a little hole made by a want, or some such like creature. Then I took out of my pocket my victuals, to which in all my voyage I had not till then any desire, and refreshed myself therewith, till such time as the people pursuing me had overtaken me, into whose hands I quietly delivered myself. They led me unto a mean officer, who, understanding that once I had escaped from them that first apprehended me, caused a certain seat to be made of boards, into which they closed me in such sort as only my head was at liberty, and then carried me upon the shoulders of four slaves, like some notorious malefactor, before a man of great authority, whom, in their language, as after I learned, they called a Mandarin, abiding a day's journey off, to wit, one league distant from the great and famous city of Pachin, or Pakin, 
by the Chinese called Sun Ti. Their language I could no way understand. Only this I could discern, that I was for something or other accused with a great deal of vehemence. The substance of this accusation, it seems, was that I was a magician, as witnessed by my strange carriage in the air, that being a stranger, as appeared by my both language and habit, I, contrary to the laws of China, entered into the kingdom without warrant, and that, probably, with no good intent. The Mandarin heard them out with a great deal of composed gravity, and being a man of quick apprehension, and withal studious of novelties, he answered them that he would take such order with me as the case required, and that my bold attempt should not want its deserved punishment. But having dismissed them, he gave orders to his servants that I should be kept in some remote part of his vast palace, and be strictly watched, but courteously used. This do I conjecture by what at the present I found, and what after followed, for my accommodation was every way better than I could expect. I lodged well, fared well, was attended well, and could not fault anything but my restraint. In this manner I did continue many months, afflicted with nothing so much as with the thought of my ganses, which I knew must be irrecoverably lost, as indeed they were. But in this time, by my own industry and the forwardness of those that accompanied me, I was grown indifferent ready in the ordinary language of that province, for almost every province in China had its proper language, whereat I discerned they took no small content. I was at length to take the air, and brought into the spacious garden of that palace a place of excellent pleasure and delight, as being planted with herbs and flowers of admirable both sweetness and beauty, and almost infinite variety of fruits, both European and others, as all those composed with that rare curiosity that I was ravished with the contemplation of such delightful objects. But I had not here long recreated myself, yet the Mandarin entered the garden on that side where I was walking, and, being advertised thereof by his servants, and wished to kneel down unto him, as I after found it to be the usual public reverence to those great officers, I did so, and humbly craved his favour towards a poor stranger that arrived in those parts not by his own destination, but by the secret disposal of the heavens. He, in a different language, which all the mandarins, as I have since learned, do use, and that, like that of the lunars, did consist much of tunes, but was by one of his servants interpreted to me, he, I say, wished me to be of good comfort, and that he intended no harm unto me, and so passed on. The next day I was commanded to come before him, and so conducted into a sumptuous dining-room exquisitely painted and adorned. The Mandarin, having commanded all to avoid the room, vouchsafed conference with me in the vulgar language, inquiring first of the estate of my country, the power of my prince, the religion and manners of the people. Wherein, being satisfied by me, he at last descended to the particulars of my education and studies, and what brought me into this remote country. Then did I at large declare unto him the adventure of my life, only omitting here and there what particulars I thought good for bearing especially any mention of the stones given me by Erdenazor. The strangeness of my story did much amaze him, and finding in all my discourse nothing any way tending to magic, wherein he had hoped by my means to have gained some knowledge, he began to admire the excellence of my wit, applauding me for the happiest man that this world had ever produced, and, wishing me to repose myself after my long narration, he for that time dismissed me. After this, the Mandarin took such delight in me that no day passed wherein he sent not for me. At length he advised me to apparel myself in the habit of country which I willingly did, and gave me not only the liberty of his house, but took me also abroad with him when he went to Paquin whereby I had the opportunity by degrees to learn the disposition of the people and the policy of the country, which I shall reserve for my second part. Neither did I by this my attendance on him gain only the knowledge of these things, but the possibility also of being restored to my native soil, and to those dear pledges which I value above the world my wife and children. For by often frequenting Paquin, I at length heard of some fathers of the society that would become famous for the extraordinary favour by the king vouchsafed them, 
to whom they had presented some European trifles as clocks, watches, dials, and the like, which with them passed for exquisite rarities. To them, by the Mandarin's leave, I repaired, was welcomed by them, they much wondering to see a lay Spaniard there, whither they had with so much difficulty obtained to arrive. There did I relate to Father Pantoya and those others of the society these four related adventures, by whose directions I put them in writing, and sent this story of my fortunes to Macau, from thence to be conveyed for Spain as a forerunner of my return. And the Mandarin, being very indulgent unto me, I came often unto the fathers, with whom I consulted about many secrets with them. Also did I lay a foundation for my return, the blessed hour whereof I do with patience expect, that, by enriching my country with the knowledge of hidden mysteries, I may once reap the glory of my fortunate misfortunes. Finis. Imprimator, Matthew Clay. The last day of July, 1638. End of part three. End of The Man in the Moon by Francis Godwin.